Okay, it's the last week in June 2011, and we're continuing our series of interviews with my father, Jack Davis, the esteemed CIA analyst who protected America from all its enemies for the last 40 years. And we've decided to change the venue a little bit. Instead of the uh, seated Talking Heads interview, we're going to talk to him today in his home office. So, the guest of honor, Jack Davis. Applause. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, if I can do the math in my head, it's um, 55 years that I've been working for CIA, first as a, an analyst and now as a consultant. And when these interviews first started, um, I wasn't as interested in my legacy, but as I approached my 81st birthday, I just wonder, and um, <laughs> there are one or two things that I can do. One is um, write another paper, bringing my own thoughts up to date, and the second is to try to find out how much influence I've had with my previous teaching and writing. Now, within CIA, um, it's pretty clear. Um, about once every two weeks, somebody comes up to me and says, you're Jack Davis, aren't you? I remember taking your course so-and-so 20 years ago, and it really influenced me. And I'm so happy to see that you're still walking in these halls. Um, there were a couple of times when um, some of my writings so impressed middle managers that they made them required reading so that the whole group could start on, say, the same page. Um, I also know um, what my influence is with the small number of um, academics who have studied and specialized in national security affairs and um, the role of intelligence, because they comment in, my, in their books, either in the text or in their signing of uh, the inside page. Uh, but what I don't know, and I'm curious, is what my influence is more generally through um, universities, uh, special schools such as military officers' courses. And I was looking at the first paper that I wrote that was unclassified. Now, papers that I wrote earlier have been declassified, but this is the first publication that I wrote that was unclassified. And you never know how much duplication there is, probably a lot, but if you notice here, it says about 12,000 hits on this one paper. Um, a couple of people are writing or have written a master's uh, degree paper analyzing what I said. Um, when I wrote it, I meant to move intelligence along a path that I thought it should go. And um, it received this, a certain amount of um, of notoriety for that reason. But now that path that I had recommended is the main path. Um, one um, keen observer on intelligence said intelligence isn't supposed to be literature. 
it's supposed to be support for action and contemplation on the part of policy officials. And to that extent, uh, there's been a sea change in analysis. Uh, one of the things I followed this up with was, um, let's see if I can get it, uh, Jack Davis and um, Opportunity Analysis. I'm going to learn how to spell it. Let's say a million, doesn't it? Again, with a lot of um, repetition. So why don't you explain to us what opportunity analysis means? Yeah, well, this is where I came out more directly with the, the doctrine I recommended in um, in the Ken Kendall paper that there was a, an, a false wall that some doctrinaire people put between intelligence and policy. That policy was on one side of the wall and intelligence was on the other side of the wall. And the reason there was a wall was to avoid politicization. Um, getting too enwrapped in what the president wanted, or what the policy of State Department was on an issue that was not up to the presidential level of interest. And I uh, decided you had to balance the old theme of we have to tell truth to power with um, you want to go from A to B, here are three ways to go from A to B, here are the costs and benefits of each way. We point, you choose. Um, I tried to change the term to action analysis, support for action, but because I thought opportunity analysis was, was kind of awkward. but. The term opportunity analysis just uh, stuck. And in this case, I really rubbed some scholars the wrong way. I don't know what page it would be on, but somebody wrote, I wish Jack Davis would get off that opportunity analysis kick and go back to the real uh, responsibility of intelligence analysis. Well. I, I, I could go on and on and on, but very often something I've written is required reading for a section of a course at a university on national security and intelligence. Very often, if you look at the list of readings for say a um, course at the uh, Advanced Naval Academy course, you'll see three or four of my works that are recommended. Now I'm going to tell a story which uh, I never quite believed, uh, but it shows you what I'm talking about. And again, it's hard to measure. Um, The book, Intelligence Analysis, let's see if I can get the exact title. Yeah.
Okay. Was dedicated to to three people. Uh, one of whom was me. Now, to give us the significance of your name being the third, why don't you tell us who the first two people are? Well, I was going to. Uh, this book was supported by um, the Georgetown University School of Peace and Security Studies. And um, the two authors, first example, the Chairman Kent, who was considered the dean of um, analysis, and whom I worked under, and I've written a lot about it. The second and third were the two people who are considered the ones who moved intelligence analysis doctrine to take account of changes that Kent couldn't have taken into account. One is Dick Hoyer, Richard Hoyer, who uh, worked on what are now called structured analytical techniques, and then the other one who emphasized the importance of critical thinking. Now, um, the anecdote. Uh, Sherman Kidd is dead. They couldn't afford to pay for Hoyer to fly in from California. So when the book was dedicated to the seminar at Georgetown University, I was the only one of the three people to whom it was dedicated who was in the room. And I got unusual attention. Um, each of the first two speakers who were the authors or the editors of the book um, talked a bit about me, what they had learned from me, and what my influence had been. And um, finally, the dean of the school, whose name I should remember, but can't for the moment, um, got up and said, I'm so glad to meet Jack Davis for the first time. I teach a course on intelligence and national security, and at the end of the course, I ask the students, the graduate students, which of the works that they read were the most influential. And invariably, each student names one, two, and even three of Jack Davis's work as having influenced them the most. Now, I say <laughs> this is exactly how it happened, whether it was exaggerated for the occasion or not, I don't know. But I imagine that. Um, there are a lot of students in graduate schools, especially, who have read my work and have been influenced by it in terms of their own work on um, intelligence. Um, I don't suppose it could ever be measured, but <laughs> I used to think that since some of my work um, needed refreshment, if not complete revision, um, as long as they're going to read it to learn about intelligence, I wish they would read Jack Davis 2011 rather than Jack Davis in 1990 or 1991 as some of these were strong. I'm going to tell one more anecdote to show this point. One of the most um, you 
I use this as well too. One of the most cited books in academic courses was an interview I did of Paul Wolfowitz, who um, at the time was the dean of Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. And he was in an academic group. He knew me. I am not a professional interviewer. And I think he said what he believed, but he also said it in terms to accommodate his respect for me. And um, there's a lot in there which I still cite in my occasional papers and in my teaching. Um, it was kind of interesting. Um, I interviewed him for about two hours in his office. I read a lot about what was available about his personal and professional life. And I showed him the first draft. And he said, um, did I really say that? I said, you said it and I'm quoting you. And he did want to take out one or two things which he thought were a little bit too sharply critical, including one of uh, critical of Bob Gates, who was then director, or de sorry, deputy director of CIA. But in any case, I would imagine that if I took the time to keystroke this, it would also reach close to a million citations. Uh, it was an interview with Paul Wolfowitz, and two or three years later, the Republicans came back into power under George Bush, George W. Bush. And Wolfowitz, who had previously held the third position of influence in the Defense Department, um, under Secretary for Policy, moved up to the second position behind Rumsfeld. He was Deputy Secretary of Defense. And I was giving a, um, a presentation somewhere in Virginia, I don't remember the exact circumstances, and after my presentation, three men started walking very curious looks on their face toward the podium. And they said that they worked for the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and therefore Ultimately, their boss was Paul Wolfowitz. So they all read my interview of Paul Wolfowitz, and he's nothing like that. In other words, he had changed uh, from an academic who had institutionally sound things to say to a policymaker who only wanted the analyst to give him the support that he sought, in good part relative to the Iraq War. I could tell more anecdotes, but I think the point comes across. A, I don't know what influence I've had. B, I wish that people who care enough about what I think could read what I think today instead of what I thought in 1990, 1992, and so on and so forth. There may be some universal uh, things, things that don't change because they underlie almost um, any set of circumstances and accurately describe the relationships, uh, say, between intelligence and policy. Uh, but my own views have changed. Uh, circumstances change. My exposure to um, 
what is going on certainly has changed and increased over the last 20 years or so. Um, I suppose I'm making too much of it, but, <laughs> but I wish I could take three or four months and um, self-publish if necessary, but I think I could get a publisher. Uh, what I consider my ten most influential studies that have been published and how my views on them have been modified. Um, this brings up one last point. Every once in a while, I note that an article of mine on which I hold the copyright, there's a notice there that would I sell the copyright to Kindle so that Kindle could add it to its list of books. And I don't know what's involved in this, but, but I would do it under one circumstance. For each work that was put on Kindle, I could write a, um, say, a five or six page introduction explaining how my views have changed. That might be sort of an intermediate way of doing what I want to do. Let me ask you a question. What is the difference between intelligence analysis and just common sense? Well, I could ask you to define common sense. There's no such thing as common sense. In, it's culturally induced. It has to do with your environment. I was just thinking of, of, of a homely analogy. Nobody from a, a, um, a culture that doesn't play baseball can throw and catch the ball the way Americans can. Obviously there are other cultures like Cuba and Venezuela that have a baseball tradition, but when you look at cricket players, they don't understand how we can throw that ball so quickly so effortlessly catch it and throw it. So you could say it's common sense, but it's not common sense. It's related to um, our culture, our values, our training. So um, if you look at the concept of critical thinking and which I define as adaptation of scientific inquiry, the methods and values of scientific inquiry to suit the circumstances of intelligence analysis. And many of these values you can call common sense. Objectivity would be one creativity in terms of thinking outside the box would be another. Skepticism, um, don't believe the first source that agrees with your thesis. But you can see where there's common sense involved. The one thing that intelligence analysis should have, that common sense doesn't have, is rigorous upholding of these standards. Uh, so the, the most interesting intersection is that common sense without the discipline of intelligence analysis has many of the same values in trying to deal with substance of uncertainty. Again, objectivity, skepticism, creativity, to mention three. You mentioned the other day your famous formula that uh, like intelligence equals data times bias. That was um, Belinda Canton um, 
You know, I used to have lunch for over 20 years, once a week for over 20 years. And at the beginning, whereas I had been in the intelligence field for decades, she was just starting to absorb the discipline. And um, she saw great insight into something which I casually said. I said analysis equals bias, which was a substitute for expertise times data, which is a substitute for um, information. So literally I said analysis equals bias times data, but the more general language would be analysis equals substance of expertise which by definition contains bias times the information on the subject that's available to you. How much more time is there? Well, do you want to talk more though about what that means? You've defined it, but what does it mean? Well, we were talking about um, how do you describe what we do? Um, if I were to talk about it in a little bit more detail, we're trying to get sound analysis based on critical thinking and expertise. Even though expertise usually called mindset, the term I introduced into the vocabulary, is blamed for a lot of intelligence failures. It should be credited for multiple intelligence successes. So you have knowledge, expertise, bias, a way of looking at the issue, how does this usually work out in countries like Egypt? What do you know about uh, the difference between a rebellion and a revolution? Times information, times critical thinking about how to evaluate that information. We talked last night about the broadening of information to include absence of information. What do you do when you don't have evidence that you think you should have? And we talked about what the analysts did in terms of estimating Iraq's likelihood of having a nuclear power, uh, sorry, a nuclear weapons program. We knew they didn't have nuclear weapons, but we thought they had chemical and biological weapons. And how did they deal with absence of information? They so what they thought, given their bias or the way they think Iraq worked, information which they could cull to, to support the thesis that they probably had chemical and biological weapons. Um, but they didn't fully take account of what they did not know. Now, in the text, they admitted what they did not know, but they didn't give it enough weight, not nearly enough weight. So 
using in this case the bias times the expertise that they had insufficient expertise and too much bias um expertise or it, data too much bias and too little data well again as we said last night um expert opinion is evidence. That's why they bring in experts in court cases who don't know anything more about the exact events but can bring to bear analogy and studies and so forth. Um, some people think that um, analysts should have an open mind. But an open mind is very close to an empty mind when you have a deadline and you have 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 or 30 people who have to sign on to um, a, a judgment. Um, the um, I was talking the other day about something I call Team A, Team B analysis, in which I recommended that if you can't give a confident judgment, it is more helpful to your policy clients to, to explain that the two ways of looking at the information we have than to say we have studied it and with low confidence we think it's going to be A. You're better off explaining A and B as possible dynamics and outcomes. Now, what I came up with was several examples of this methodology or trait character, as I would call it, in which they said, in effect, um, we just aren't sure, we have low confidence in outcome A, I'm using that symbolically, but we want to show you the argument for B as well as A. Well, does B have even lower confidence than A? Is that your point? Well, my point is that we shouldn't have a confidence level. And then, but I mean, if B had higher confidence than A, then B would be the A. Well, let's take this literally. Um, if I say there's a 55% chance that you, your flight back to Los Angeles will get you there safely. Wouldn't you want to know what the other 45% is? Sure. Well, that's what you have here. It doesn't matter whether one is slightly more likely than the other. We can't tell the too many variables, the too many of what um, are different Former Secretary of Defense runs so called unknown unknowns. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is they take the step of saying because we can't support A with sufficient confidence, we're going to tell you about B. And at the end, they say we still think A is more likely. And my reaction after reading a couple of these was that this is the equivalent of um, giving analysts permission to run away from home but not letting them cross the street. The purpose of A and B is not to choose but to explain the ifs and the accepts and the causes 
which would give you parallel um, outcomes. And if you take it back to um, the um, run-up to the Iraq War, what if half the paper had made a cogent argument following the diktats of um, sound analysis of critical thinking, with the exception that they treated the absence of information differently and didn't tell the policymakers which was more likely, but let the policymakers do their own homework. But isn't the point of professional analysis to tell the policymakers which is more likely? But are you saying they didn't even tell them what the alternative was? They said, this is what we think with low confidence, but we're not even going to tell you what the alternatives are. Well, the, um, this is one of the questions where I usually put my little statue of Don Quixote on the, uh, I have one at work, on the table. The answer to your question is no. Um, there are two kinds, at least two kinds, of policy makers. Those who receive our analysis and they want an answer. And I usually exaggerate this by saying there's a, an admiral who wants to know whether to take his girlfriend to Bimini for the weekend or should he stand by because a war is going to break out. So he says, don't give me on the one hand, on the other hand, just tell me, is there going to be a war? The policy maker that I'm most interested in is figuratively spending 24-7 on the same issue. He's probably been in the country several times. He's probably on the phone with the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador, probably visiting businessmen, stop by to tell them what, what's going on. He probably gets email from a lot of professors with their judgment. Why the hell should he pay much attention to a 30-year-old analyst who he's never met, who's never been to the country? And he says, I can't answer the question because there are too many variables. Who cares what the opinion of this youngster at CIA is? Don't give me your bottom line. Tell me what you know that I don't know so I can think more um, cogently about the issue. Now again, um, more of this is done than um, used to be done, but it's been a hard task because, and here's where I sometimes get in trouble, we haven't killed all the editors. Editors want a draft to run smoothly, a strong title, a first paragraph that supports the title and subsequent paragraphs that support the first paragraph. In other words, it's sort of like a pyramid in the universe. Um, life isn't linear. Our knowledge on most issues is not sufficient to write in a linear fashion, but we can't talk about alternatives and keep the, the kind of sequitur and smoothness and what I call overconfidence that editors appreciate in them. If you if you go into the office, or if you're on the telephone, 
or if a policy maker, a decision maker, um, somebody who's really in control of the issue, four or five people below the level of the president who are working on the issue. Their questions are never, what do you think is going to happen? They're about the elements that they're looking at. What can we say about the amount of support amongst the troops that you pick your dictator still has? Um, what will we see if there were a mass defection? Um, is there any tradition in this country of the military turning against the leader. The things where we have the time and the expertise to help him deal with the uncertainty. But the last thing he wants is the CIA to say, probably you'll be okay. Um, there is a series of commercials which I called attention to uh, my team and I wish they could remember them better, but they were about the banality of problem. Uh, in one, you had somebody about to parachute out of an airplane, and he turned to his handler. Was this parachute folded properly? Probably. I think the most important thing for intelligence to do is to find out what lurks on the other side of probably. So um, again, I'm not against making a bottom line judgment, but if it's a weak one, it's pretty useless. So in conclusion, you think it's better to list all the possibilities than to try to conclude it in only one possibility when the evidence is not well, overwhelming. Um, I would rather leave that open. I think the dichotomy is between predicting and explaining. You can't, um, as someone once said, this is we can't find out who said it. It's now attributed to me. No analyst ever made a list of the things he hadn't thought of. So you can't list all of the outcomes. But you can talk about the dynamics which you think will affect the outcome. And I call that explanation. Um, now, a lot of um, ways in which we're important do have a strong factual basis. Um, we have engineers and weapons experts and information and expertise on physical possibilities. And when we see a missile test, we can talk factually about its characteristics. And um, we can tell the policymaker that it could reach everything in this circle. Um, and the policymaker may ask questions, but the basic thing there is to make a judgment. But when it comes to um, the variables that affect, say, the situation in Libya, or the situation even in Egypt, or in Saudi Arabia, um, to talk about what's going to be three years down the line, when we don't know what's going to be six months down the line. 
is not helpful to an expert as much as the two or three ways in which Saudi Arabia may go. These are the variables to watch to determine which way it actually does go. Let's call it quits. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you about in the room, there's um, there's some interesting things in the room and maybe on the next tape I'd like to do a tour. But one thing in particular is there's quite a few notebooks up here marked with the letters ISF and then the names of trouble spots. And I was wondering if you could tell us what ISF means, just what the letters mean and then what it means to you philosophically. Well, um, in effect, when I got um, fired by Casey, I went to um, Georgetown University for a year, and um, I started thinking about why people differ. Why do people look at data in different ways? A lot of the material that's in that purple book, the thin purple book about, you know, about six inches from the right. Who pulled that? Which? Oh, psychology. Yeah, that's it. I wrote the introduction to that book. We'll trust you. But you haven't yet told us what the wor what the letters, ISF. Yeah, well, I'm getting to it. Okay. Um, it's interesting that my introduction got reviewed more often than the, uh, than the book itself. Okay. Well, when I got back from my year's exile, um, the word was from Gates, who is now deputy director, that uh, I had two alternatives to find a position out of the building or to resign. He didn't want me in the building. So I went to what was then called the Office of Training, and there was a analytical training subset. And a very accomplished person wrote it, ran it, and he said, Jack, uh, Casey has asked for a course on intelligence failures, successes and failures. ISF intelligence successes of failures. And we've never had anybody who had the background or the courage to organize this course. And um, I said, no problem. I'll have a course for you in six months. And I did. And ISF. Um, This is the fall of the Soviet Union. There's one on the Falklands crisis. Um, in other words, I just put together all the papers that I wrote on those. I taught it for five or six years, and it became the most influential course at all, of all, because I was explaining why Gates and Casey differed from our judgments and what we could do about it. In other words, the case was ostensibly about why we fail and what's needed for success, but the leitmotif was how do you get along 
with Casey and Gates and maintain your professionalism. And uh, I think you were there uh, at my 50th anniversary. One of these speakers said, how many of you have taken this course? And I think two or three dozen hands went up. These books sustained me when I lost my security clearance for six months. I organized these books. I never look at them as I throw them away. So your point is that if we want to do better intelligence, we have to understand intelligence failures. Yeah, it, it's sort of like before the um, fast computers, doctors learned from diseases, not from well people. Now doctors can learn from well people as well. And there have been several efforts to learn from successes. But as my favorite professor said, you have to be very careful because every time there's been an intelligent success, one ingredient has been oxygen. I've told you that. But can you explain that? Well, it, it's kind of hard to know what caused the success because you have no control. Um, the easier the question, the more greater likelihood of success. Okay, we, we have about eight minutes left on this tape. Could you talk in seven minutes about an important intelligence failure that you'd like to teach to your class? If um, the books were in order, I could show you my first model. But obviously they're not in order. The, um, what I was more interested in was the experience of the analysts. And I came up with five packages for uh, analysts who hadn't experienced a failure or a success. What I preferred was for them to tell me what the challenges were. Now I had enough influence as a teacher that they fed back to me a lot of my own doctrine. But uh, this isn't going to help. But I came up with a model that um, showed a disappearing Well, actually, it was a, a pyramid on its head. We lost insight because our collection was skewed in some way, and we depended too much on what came in from collection especially the D.O. and not a lot of other available information. Then the, it narrowed still further because we really didn't understand what our relationship with policy should be. And the third time it narrowed because of the not understanding the limits of how the human mind works when there's uncertainty. And the fourth and final disappearance of the um, 
what would have been insight was administrative um, practices, including the systematic overconfidence that um, editors uh, called for. Um, if I were to, um, to teach again, um, I don't think I would focus on successes and failures. This course is still given by people. I don't even know who they are. Um, but I would come up with say, eight challenges to sound analysis and how to manage them. One challenge would be the limitations of um, human mind what are usually called cognitive biases as opposed to worldview biases. And uh, there's a lot in common between what I would teach and this book, um, Why Intelligence Fails. And this, again, is more polite than it should be for all the help over the years. Um, another challenge would be how do you manage absence of information? And so on and so forth. Now, I would let them illustrate cases, but I would prefer that the learning of the cases not take too much time. So if I were dealing with, let's go back to absence of information, rather than studying the failure on uh, Iraq in itself, I would have two or three analysts from that region of the world or that group of um, specialists say, how did they handle absence of information? Was there a better way? In other words, instead of getting at the failures as colorful incidents, I would try to get at the recurring challenges. Um, The, um, one of the things that we have to deal with is the fact that influence and quality do not follow the same bar. In other words, they're not 100% compatible. In order to have influence, you sometimes have to address issues in ways which help policymakers, but don't get at some of the root um, problems that we would write if policymakers had to pay attention to what we write. Um, The, um, when I was a national intelligence officer, we met about 30 times on um,
the Nicaragua El Salvador situation. And um, I told the member of the National Security Council staff who specialized in Latin America, saying I could write a three or four page paper explaining why we have this problem that would make our discussions more effective. And he said, Jack, it's too late for that. They want solutions, not explanations. And so what I did, in effect, was help them decide what actions to recommend to the president on this day and that day and the other day. It was all a matter of uh, putting out fires without fully understanding the causes of the fires or some other intonation. And um, what I've decided, and I'm not the first one to decide, is you have to gain recognition and confidence and access to policy makers, feeding them red meat, which is the analogy, if you want them to eat their vegetables. Once they get to know who you are, they'll listen to you. It was kind of interesting that at least 20 meetings, they didn't invite the director or CIA, who was then Admiral Turner. It was funny. I was the lowest 